first shower was moderate, accompanied by a violent rain, the effects of which they did but little feel. Soon after, a most violent torrent of rain descended, accompanied with hail. The rain appeared to descend in a body, and instantly collected in the ravine, and came down in a rolling torrent with irresistible force, driving rocks, mud, and everything before it which opposed its passage. Captain Clark fortunately discovered it a moment before it reached them, and, seizing his gun and shot pouch with his left hand, with the right, he assisted himself up the steep bluff, shoving occasionally the Indian woman before him, who had her child in her arms. Charbonneau had the woman by the hand, endeavoring to pull her up the hill, but was so much frightened that he remained frequently motionless, and, but for Captain Clark, both himself and his woman and child must have perished. So sudden was the rise of the water that before Captain Clark could reach his gun and begin to ascend the bank, it was up to his waist and wet his watch, and he could scarcely ascend faster than it arose till it had obtained the depth of fifteen feet with a current tremendous to behold. One moment longer, and it would have swept them into the river, just above the great cataract of eighty-seven feet, where they must have inevitably perished. In the evening, the men in two of the rear canoes discovered a large brown bear lying in the open grounds about three hundred paces from the river, and six of them went out to attack him, all good hunters. They took the advantage of a small eminence which concealed them and got within forty paces of him unperceived. Two of them reserved their fires that had been previously concerted. The four others fired nearly at the same time and put each his bullet through him. Two of the balls passed through the bulk of both lobes of his lung. In an instant, the monster ran at them with open mouth. The two who had reserved their fires discharged their pieces at him as he came toward them. Both of them struck him, one only slightly, and the other fortunately broke his shoulder. This, however, only retarded his motion for a moment only. The men, unable to reload their guns, took to flight. The bear pursued and had very nearly overtaken them before they reached the river. Two of the party betook themselves to a canoe, and the others separated and concealed themselves among the willows, reloaded their pieces, each discharged his piece at him as they had an opportunity. They struck him several times again, but the guns served only to direct the bear to them. In this manner, he pursued two of them separately so close that they were obliged to throw aside their guns and pouches and throw themselves into the river, although the bank was nearly twenty feet perpendicular. So enraged was this animal that he plunged into the river only a few feet behind the second man he had compelled to take refuge in the water. When one of those who was still remained on shore shot him through the head and finally killed him. They then took him on shore and butchered him when they found eight balls had passed through him in different directions. The bear being old, the flesh was indifferent, and they therefore only took the skin and fleece. The latter made us several gallons of oil. Last night was excessively cold. The mercury this morning set at 40 below zero, which is 72 degrees below the freezing point. We had one man out last night who returned about 8 o'clock this morning. The Indians of the lower villages turned out to hunt for a man and a boy who had not returned from the hunt of yesterday and borrowed a sleigh to bring them in expecting to find them froze to death. About 10 o'clock, the boy, about 13 years of age, come to the fort with his feet froze and had laid out all last night without a fire with only a buffalo robe to cover him. The dress which he wore was a pair of antelope leggings, which is very thin moccasins. We had his feet put in cold water, and they are coming too. Soon after the arrival of the boy, a man come in who had also stayed out without fire and very thinly clothed. This man was not the least injured. Customs and the habits of those people has answered to bear more cold than I thought it possible for a man to endure. A fair morning, the wind from the southeast, raised a flag, staff, and formed an awning and shade on a sandbar in the mouth of the Teton River to council under, the greater portion of the party to continue on board. About eleven o'clock, the first and second chief arrived. We gave them to eat, they gave us some meat. At twelve o'clock, the council commenced, and after a smoking agreeable to the usual custom, Captain Lewis delivered a written speech to them. I some explanations, etc. All party paraded, gave a medal to the Grand Chief Black Buffalo. Bad fellow, Buffalo Medicine. We invited those chiefs and a soldier on board our boat and showed them many curiosities, which they were much surprised. We gave them half a wine glass of whiskey, which they appeared to be exceedingly fond of. 
They took up an empty bottle, smelt it, and made many simple gestures, and soon began to be troublesome. The second chief, affecting drunkenness as a cloak for his villainous intentions, reeled or fell about the boat. I went in the pirogue with the chief who left the boat with a great reluctance. My object was to reconcile them and leave them on shore. As soon as I landed, three of the young men seized the cable of the pirogue, one soldier hugged the mast, and the second chief was exceedingly insolent both in words and gestures to me, declaring I should not go off saying he had not received presents sufficient from us. I attempted to pacify him, but it had a contrary effect, for his insults became so personal and his intentions evident to do me injury. I drew my sword and ordered all hands under arms. At this motion, Captain Lewis ordered all the boat under arms. The few men that was with me having previously taken up their guns with a full determination to defend me if possible. The Grand Chief then took hold of the cable and sent all the young men off. The soldier got out of the pirogue, and the second chief walked off to the party about twenty yards back, all of which had their bows strung and guns cocked. I then spoke in very positive terms to them all, but principally addressing myself to the first chief, who let the rope go and walked to the Indian party. I again offered my hand to the first chief, who refused it. All this time the Indians were pointing their arrows. I proceeded to the pirogue and pushed off and had not proceeded far before the first and third chief and two principal men walked into the water and requested to go on board. I took them in, and we proceeded on about a mile and anchored near a small island. I call this island Bad Humored Island. Captain Clark set out this morning to go ahead with six hunters. There being no game in these mountains, we concluded it would be better for one of us to take hunters and hurry on to the level country ahead and their hunt and provide some provision, while the other remained with and brought on the party. We suffered for water this day, passing one rivulet only. We were fortunate in finding water in a steep ravine about a half mile from our camp. This morning we finished the remainder of our last colt. We dined and souped on a scant proportion of portable soup, a few canisters of which, a little bear oil and 20 pounds of candles from our stock of provisions, the only resource being our guns and pack horses. The first is but a poor dependence in our present situation, for there is nothing upon earth except ourselves and a few small pheasants, small gray squirrels, and a blue bird of the vulture kind, about the size of a turtle dove or jay bird. We took a small quantity of portable soup and retired to rest, much fatigued. Several of the men are unwell with the dysentery. Breakings out or interruptions of the skin have also been common with us for some time. I directed the horses to be hobbled to prevent the delay in the morning being determined to make a forced march tomorrow in order to reach, if possible, the open country. We killed a few pheasants and I killed a prairie wolf, which together with the balance of our horse beef and some crawfish we obtained from the creek enabled us to make one more hearty meal, not knowing where the next was to be found. I find myself growing weak for the want of food, and most of the men complain of a similar deficiency and have fallen off very much. We had proceeded about two and a half miles when we met Reuben Fields, one of our hunters, whom Captain Clark had dispatched to meet us with some dried fish and roots that he had procured from a band of Indians, whose lodges were about eight miles in advance. I ordered the party to halt for the purpose of taking some refreshment. I divided the fish, roots, and berries, and was happy to find the sufficiency to satisfy completely all our appetites. Fields also killed a crow. After refreshing ourselves, we proceeded to the village. Music 